Welcome to LaunchPod, a product management podcast brought to you by LogRocket. Today, our guest is Charles Battle, head of product at Ibotta, a Denver-based performance marketing platform known for its cashback offers and digital coupons. Charles leads a 50-person product organization that oversees various disciplines, including product management, product design, product analytics, and UX research. Previously, Charles worked at TouchTunes Interactive Networks and several financial technology companies, such as American Express, LendingTree, and Guaranteed Rate. On today's episode, Charles shares his experience with Ibotta's recent IPO and their strategic pivot from a direct-to-consumer cashback app to a performance marketing company. He discusses the impact of the IPO on the team, the importance of prioritization and focusing on problem solving in product development, and how the company validated and executed their new strategy. So here it is, our conversation with Charles Battle. All right, Charles, thanks so much for joining. This one has been a little bit of time in the works. You guys are what, two months out now from the IPO? How, how are you feeling? How's that going? Yeah, I appreciate your patience. It's been a, a heck of a past few months. Now, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. You know, it's it's been a journey. I think I've been with the Ibotta for two and a half years. So even in that time, it's felt like a journey. But we've got many folks on the team who've been there since the very beginning. So it was just wonderful to just go through this big milestone with all of these folks who've worked so hard to to make this a reality. So it's been, it's been a blast. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a blast. Well, congrats. It's, you know, it's always a big step. There's a lot. I've been through a couple and it, there's always a lot that goes into it. So, you know, it's a marathon. <laughs> definitely um, is. Definitely is. You you kind of mentioned the team and you've had people who've been there, you know, from the beginning up to, you know, you've been there, you said, you know, two, two and a half years. What, I guess, team wise, like what's been the impact there? How did that look, you know, to the process of maybe how you're planning or, or how the team operates? I guess, you know, this is something that not everyone gets to go to through that often. So. Yeah. You know, how'd that impact kind of how you run product? Just to, well, I, we're just to dive right in here. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I, I think, you know, first and foremost, I think we had to, you know, throughout the process and as we start to started to see this become a reality and we knew that, hey, we've got our eyes set on a date, this is going to happen. Certainly we had a lot of work to do, right? We had just work across the organization that needed to get done. And so we rallied behind that and figured out what absolutely needed to get done before we went through the IPO process. <clears throat> and, you know, in many ways, that was just a continuation of what we try and do all the time as, as a product team, which is ruthless prioritization, making mm-hmm. sure that we're putting the things at the top of the list that really absolutely have to get done. And so in a way, it provided just a, a great level of focus for me and for the team and really the whole organization about like, all right, like let's really agree on what we're going to do and what we're not going to do leading up into this. I'll also say that we had to kind of remind people along the way to like, stop and take a look around, like, enjoy this, like, enjoy some of the chaos, enjoy like, you know, this fever pitch leading up to this big moment. Because as you said, not everybody gets to go through this. We all feel very fortunate that we had the opportunity to do this and that we know it may not come again. So it's like, enjoy the ride while we're here, especially that day, I think being on the floor of the stock exchange, it was really emotional. Like you look around and like, especially folks who've put so much time and there were family members there. And it's just like this, it was the beautiful moment that, that you got to experience this and people who worked so hard to make this happen. And so I think, look for product, I think it gave us a, a, you know, just a chance to focus really rally and work on what needed to get, get worked on. And then, you know, I think just also try and enjoy the ride. Like it was, it was a fun ride. It's almost like, I remember on my wedding day, people telling me to stop and look around. It's the same thing on, on you know, bell <laughs> yeah. day, right? Where just take it in because it's not, you know, even if you do it again, it's not like you're going to do this every year. So it's a it's, special occasion. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny that you say that. I, I had the same advice given to me on my wedding day. And I even had someone, a friend of mine come over and be like, I'm going to pretend to talk to you right now, but I'm not going to say anything. What I want you to do is just look around the room and notice all of these people who are here for you. And I, I was like, it, it's, it felt very much like a wedding, actually, because, you know, there are all these family members there, all these you know employees for the company, investors for the company, all there together, sharing in this moment. And it, it had that kind of, you know, big ceremonial feeling to it. It was, it was wild. A, that's a good friend. Right. <laughs> but, but B, also like, yeah, I mean, even even for you, two and a half years is not a short amount of time. We had Aji Abuzzi on the other day, and he talked about, you know, it's so important to pick the startup you go after because 
it's it's going to be a huge swath of your life. And even two and a half years is a significant portion. So, you know, again, congrats on that. I do kind of want to get into a little bit. I've always, I feel like early on in my career, I got good advice on this. I'm always curious to get other people's takes. Someone said to me early on, a, a person who went on to be a mentor for years and years, an IPO is just a financial event, right? It's it's another liquidity event that happens. It's not an end game. How do you kind of look at it, I guess, strategically in that, in that sense, is it you know a good end game? Is it a good checkpoint, a good celebration point, a good v- validation of the work you've done, or like how do you kind of tell your team or think about it with your team on on how to think about that? Yeah, you know, I think it's a milestone, right? It's not the end by no. any, any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> in many ways, it's kind of like you know, it's kind of the start in so many ways. It's it's like a new start as this new entity. It's like we've emerged from you know the the cocoon and now we've become this other thing as a public company, which. Which, I mean, look, I, I think it's important to stop and to celebrate. I think that's a uh, part of our culture. Like we want to make sure that we do celebrate the wins. And it's it's a win because it is a moment in time where you get to look back at what we've built as a company and be proud of that. And, and it's nice to see the validation in the public market. You know, I think that that's always wonderful. But in many ways, you know, a few of us were talking internally about this. We were just kind of ready. We were ready to get get beyond it, right? Like let's this is awesome. It's really exciting that we're going through this, but now let's focus on being a great public company and and see where we can take this now. And and I think we all feel really great about what we're doing and we're just looking forward to the future. Yeah, that's that's I think that's a great way of looking at it. like I remember early on it may have been an investor, but I think it was luckily a teammate who brought up every round of funding is just kind of a reason to work even harder. And then you hit an IPO and it's it's like you said it's a new beginning but kind of another reason to go revalidate what you're doing with a great backing of, you know, there's certain things I feel like that it gives you the legitimacy where you're going to enter a whole new tier of customers possibly, you know, moving on, moving on. The IPO is great. Could talk about it forever, but moving on to that, I don't know if, I don't know if the audience would love, you know, the deep financial dissection of an IPO. So, you know, when you were thinking about building product and and like you said, you joined two and a half years ago, an IPO, especially post, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley is not a short process. Were you brought on kind of with the idea that this is where it was going and you were kind of helping to steer the ship there or were you brought on and building it and kind of it, it got to that point and that's where you guys went? We knew and I, I, I joined the company thinking that it was a, you know, a possibility for sure and something that we were we were exploring very seriously. I don't know that I was brought on to, you know, prepare the company for IPO. I certainly wouldn't characterize it like that. And so, no, I think it was more, more important than the IPO. Honestly, we were, we were pivoting our business in many ways. We were this consumer focused mobile application for the most part, our core business, you know, still is a huge part of our business, but we were moving more to being a true kind of performance marketing SaaS company and, and doing more B2B product development. And so I think it was, you know, honestly, the reason I joined Ibotta was because I was excited by that story, that narrative that we were creating. And I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, like you do have to pick your your companies very carefully when you're in product. I felt really great about this company for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is just the leadership team being incredibly strong. But also I felt very strongly and still to this day feel incredibly strongly about our strategy. Like our company strategy is great. I believe it. I believe in the pivot. This is a company that is not afraid to make hard choices when we have to. And you know, I'm just really proud to 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 work work at Ibotta. I think it's just you know we've it's kind of I tell people a lot of times it's like the classic innovators dilemma. Yeah. Ibotta had a cash cow, and you know we you know I think appropriately and strategically siphoned off the proceeds from the cash cow to build the you know the new business internally, which became the Ibotta Performance Network. And it's rare to actually see that work out, right? A lot of companies you know tr- try to do that. They you know they understand the challenge inherent in the innovators dilemma, but it's just hard to kind of turn off the cash cow and, and, and yeah. to stop investing so much in that cash cow. But yeah, I think we've, we've done a really nice job of doing that. It's a prescient move if you can align the company behind it, because someone's going to innovate there. It's either going to be you or someone else innovating on you. So better to innovate right. on yourself, I guess. I do want to get into that pivot because it, it's super, you know, obviously my background's in marketing. I come to this because we, we do run most of the functions in the company, like like a product team, especially we run marketing, I think very much like a product team. But before we jump into the pivot there and, and that move, I do want to talk a little bit about the career that kind of brought you here because I, I, I was laughing when I kind of 
look through your LinkedIn and, and this came to me, but you have found a remarkably wide breadth of ways in the companies you've been at to to get money into the hands of consum- consumers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you know, was that was that planned? I guess was that you know something you kind of looked Gosh. at and said this is this is like personal, I guess personal finance or something like that. That's a fascinating observation. <laughs> that I, honestly, like it takes almost someone looking outside in to to notice yeah. those things. You know, I think way leads on to way. And uh, I actually started my product career uh, not in fintech, but at a company called TouchTunes, which uh, is a music technology company. And so I was, I built a karaoke application. And I was, you know, I'm a musician. So I, I loved that job. It was, it was such a great job, especially a good place to start because it was a small company. I learned so much about how to do product there. I'm so grateful for the time there. But, but from there, I went to American Express. And honestly, I think from there, it just kind of became like, loyalty, fintech, rewards. I kind of just played in that space for a while. And I think, you know, I think I just kind of saw the next opportunity adjacent to wherever I was. And it happened to also be in this realm. And so it's, it, it is interesting. I, I do think I, I like personal finance a lot. And I like rewards a lot because I think there's a high overlap between say like loyalty and product, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's basically, you know, I mean, engagement is one of our key metrics is product yeah. people. And so loyalty is a tactic for engagement. And so I think there is an interesting overlap in the product space when you think about cashback, rewards, loyalty systems. But yeah, it's a, it's a funny observation. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of it, but yeah. <laughs> who knows what I'll do next? I don't know. Right. I mean, I'm not going anywhere, but yeah, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's some, someplace totally different. <laughs> Looking at your past about 10 years, I, I, I'm going to have to keep an eye on your career because I think about 50% of the companies you've been at, I'm a customer of. So maybe I'll start trying to predict what I'm going to buy based on where you well, work. It's funny. I'm, I'm, I, I do believe I love a strong brand, right? I look for strong leaders and a strong brand. I, I almost think like a VC in many ways, yeah. right? Like I, I, when I'm deciding where to invest myself, mm-hmm. I look for people that I can really get behind that I respect, leaders that I want to work with and collaborate with. And I look for a company that has a strong strategy and a brand to back it up. And, yeah. and yeah, so I, you know, I think I'm, I'm proud to have worked at many of the companies I've worked for. I think that they're great companies. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a night, you know, between American Express, Lending Tree, Guaranteed Rate, you know, Abata, right? It's, it's a list that, you know, you'll find people who know most of those. So you know, yeah. it's a, it's a cool little feather in the cap. I, I noticed at Amex, you worked kind of on, on some of the loyalty products, right? Now, I guess kind of going through some of the roles, you hit Ibotta and there's there's a big component of that there. Did you were you area able to carry over any of those lessons or anything that worked or you know, is it kind of you have to reinvent, you know, that kind of strategy every time anyway, because different company, different persona, different, you know, grouping? Yeah, a, a little bit of different company, but but so much of product I think is transferable. I think that's the beautiful thing about the job is that you know, ultimately, you're, I mentioned an earlier engagement, you're either going after kind of acquisition engagement, monetization, like there's, it, yeah, they're all different products, sometimes, or you're building different features, or you're kind of solving different, you know, customer problems. But at the end of the day, um, I think the skill set is, is really transferable. So now that said, yes, I absolutely think that there are pieces of, you know, working at membership on membership awards at American Express and kind of thinking about how loyalty ties in to customer engagement. All of those things, I think, certainly helped me in the job at Ibotta. They helped me at a, a guaranteed rate for sure, too, as we were thinking about ways to, you know, move beyond transactional, right? Like so, so many companies have technology where it's a transactional relationship with the customer. And it's funny, I, I've never really thought about this until now, but so so much of my career has been moving from transactional day zero interactions mm-hmm. with a user to lifetime value and, mm-hmm. and really thinking about re- a retained user over a certain period of time. And so that was the story at Lending Tree because it was very much a lead gen company. And, you know, you see a customer come in, you connect them with lenders yeah. and you sort of are uh, as Lending Tree sort of back out as the entity and say, all right, I've connected you with lenders. You know, our job is done here. And we were like, well, wait, why do we why do we want to remarket to customers all the time? Why don't we create a relationship with this customer and make it easier for them to have, you know, all kinds of different relationships with with different financial partners and financial services companies? And so, yeah, I think that those things have been a you know a big part of my career. I think just kind of moving from transactional to more of an engaged relationship between the company and the user. It's funny I mentioned already once um, we had Uji on the on the podcast. 
a little bit ago, but he actually has this framework in his book coming out uh, talking about kind of, you know, it's a four square and it's low frequency, high frequency kind of niche niche use case, you know, widespread use case. And that's one of the things he talks about is, is moving up into high frequency. So interesting to see that kind of at play across those yeah. financial institutions. FinTech is fun for that way too. I think, I mean, going back to that, but I mean, FinTech is really fun because, the, yeah. you know, especially at like a lending tree or guaranteed rate, um, you know, there's just a, a such a breadth of interesting offerings to give users, right? And financial, and as we think about AI and, and, and data and everything that's happening there, there's so much fodder there, creative fodder mm -hmm. with financial data. You know, we did a lot of work with credit file information at LendingTree. And so if you look at an actual credit file, the JSON of a credit file, it's incredible how much is in there. And you take mm -hmm. all of that rich data and you combine it with other data that you may have, your own first party data. You can do such cool, interesting things. And the modeling opportunities are just enormous. And so Anyway, that's why I think fintech is really interesting too. I, I often think this way about baseball too. Like I, I envy product people who get to work in sports because there's so much <laughs> data in sports. Like if you think about the exhaust, the data exhaust from like a baseball game, just one oh, yeah. baseball game, it's incredible, right? It's incredible oh, it's what ridiculous. they do with it. And their ability now to kind of capture it and actually auto, you know, it used to be, I, I played baseball growing up and you'd have to have a kid sitting there writing down every pitch and I used to do that. Zone. Yeah. And now it's, now it's all automated. It's, it's wonderful. The, the data geeks are speaking as one myself, loving it. Like it's so much easier now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I am constantly in awe of the, the UX around watching and consuming yeah. sports these days. Because yeah. it, it's a wonderful experience. They've done so much with it. Like I watch a lot of tennis, golf. Like what the, the way that they bring you into the the sport through data, through the user experience of, you know, uh, analyzing different shots and things. It's just, it's very, very cool. It's amazing what, what you know, what they can do. Yeah. No, it was, it was interesting. I was at, I think it was AWS reInvent last year and they had a whole section set up or it might've been Google Next. It was one of those two. I forget now. It's probably Google Next, but they had a setup where they were talking about how their cloud was powering the analytics of the NFL. And it was showing all the stuff from like helmet acceleration and deacceleration to ball tracking, to catching, uncatching, you know, people stepping outside of bounds. It was, it was wild, the stuff they were capturing automatically. So that's amazing. And when you think of just like, again, pr product optimization is a huge part of the job. And you think about like, you know, if everything's a product, you know, a sports team is a product, right? Yeah. And there's a there's a group of product managers <laughs> in the back office <laughs> that manage that pro that manage that product, and they're taking their data, their analytics in, and saying, "Oh gosh, you know, this receiver can't catch this kind of ball, or they're really bad in this kind of scenario." And like the more that you have that that data rich environment to operate within, the more you know, better the more decisions you can make, and, and the higher quality those decisions are going to be. So it's just anyway. Really cool, but yeah, I could geek out on this stuff too. I love, I love, I love all that. No, to, to, to I guess to leave the topic, but could, do you think we could start calling like normalize calling uh, football head coaches chief product officers? Sure, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, um, absolutely. Was it Jack Dorsey who said that they were you know product managers are like book editors uh, or right. editors? And and I used to work in book publishing, so <laughs> I always I always found that to be really real. That was my first career before I kind of uh, hit reset and got into product, yeah. but I always thought that to be a really a, a really apt yeah. you know metaphor for it because I think it's it's absolutely right. Like we're not the ones making the stuff; we're kind of editing and guiding and framing the making, yeah. um, and hopefully making it better, better. and making it better, making yeah. and, and understanding what the audience wants. Exactly. Right, a book editor in many ways is saying the audience needs this kind of book. But it needs to be shaped in this kind of a way. So it's like, right. yeah, very similar. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a noble profession when even Stephen King needs an editor. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, Some of the greatest authors had fantastic editors who did a yeah. lot, a lot behind the scenes. You know. Oh, so. you need the whole chain. It's it's you know I I don't think you know I was at Log Rocket when we were very early on. Our product team was our engineering team, but it was very early people who thought about the entire thing through. And it's interesting to see. I've worked with engineers who maybe don't think about the whole thing. They just want to, you know, we've, and we've had guests on the podcast who've talked about, they were a very like, you know, talk about a feature, build feature, ship feature kind of organization. And when they moved to a more wholly integrated kind of looking at the big picture, what they found is the work was better and everyone's worried it was going to slow them down. It actually ended up, they were able to increase velocity because 
you didn't get to the end and kind of realize you forgot stuff. You didn't kind of hit the next step, ship it and realize, oh, we didn't do 50% of what people needed. You, you had a more complete vision. You did the work the first time a little bit better. So that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now going back probably like 10 minutes at this point, <laughs> um, Abada, right? You, you came on and during that time, you know, you and the team and the company switched from being a very D to C kind of direct to consumer cashback app to really performance marketing. And you talked about this very briefly and, and I said, we'd come back to it. You kind of milked the cash cow while, you know, building the next thing. Or, or I've talked to the team about, you know, we've had initiatives before. I've said, we need to kind of like Sully Sullenberg this thing down into the Hudson while we stitch the wingsuit and glide out victoriously. Uh, not saying, not nothing about Ibotta being a plane going down to the Hudson, by the way. I don't want to make that. Right, right, right. But right. I guess what drove, can you get more into what kind of drove the analysis and conclusion that you needed to pivot? And how did you look at the next thing to do? Like, how'd that come about? I think um, some of this predates my time at the company, yeah. but I think, you know, I, I think it was really not so much that we need to find a new thing as much as it was, there's this big opportunity that's emerging that we need to explore and we need to figure out how to invest in it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was very much an and not an or, Yeah. but you know, there's this, there's this concept in entrepreneurship called you know, burden hand, right? It's mm -hmm. a lot of it's about around entrepreneurial like effectuation and burden hand is like, what, what do we already have? Like, you know, either as a person, as an organization, whatever, like what do we already have that we could leverage more of? Mm -hmm. Right. And we looked around organizationally and said, well, we've got all this great, content from brands and you know why limit that content to just being published in our own consumer mobile application like that doesn't make a lot of sense couldn't we reach more people if we kind of found them where they already are if we kind of distributed that content through retailer websites through retailer mobile applications and not just the ibotta branded experiences and i think that was just a huge unlock for the company to say well, wait a second, like we're already setting this stuff up. Why not just, instead of publishing one place, publish multiple mm -hmm. places. And I would say we, we, we have these incredible relationships with brands already. And so we're, we're getting the content in. And so it just made a lot of sense. I think when we took a step back, I think it, it just made a lot of sense. And then from there it was, okay, well, can we, can we line someone up to do this with us? And then when we got the agreement with Walmart, it just became, well, mm -hmm. this is fantastic. Like now we got to run and make this thing really work. And, and that was a, a huge, huge momentum boost for us. Was there a process you guys went through to kind of validate the idea or, or kind of figure out what, you know, it's one thing to have concept and then another thing to figure out what does this actually look like? What do we build? What do we build first? What does success yeah. look like? Can you, can you walk us through that process a little bit maybe? You know, it's fascinating because we have on one hand, this very mature business in our consumer application where we, we know very well, like kind of what to do, how to optimize. We've really optimized it to the nth degree. And, and then on our B2B side, I'd say we're still kind of a, very much a startup. Like, we, you know, we, we are figuring things out. We are, it's so early in the product life cycle that I think we're, we're discovering there are moments where we don't quite have product market fit yet. We, we know kind of writ large, we do, that there is a need for this and a need for this thing that we've provided. But, you know, we'll talk with a, a potential partner and they'll say, oh, well, like, have you thought about this? And we're like, oh, no, no, we haven't, but I'm glad we're talking, right? Like, it's, this sounds so funny to say, but in many ways, like Walmart, you know, was was almost kind of an MVP when we when we brought them on the, the IPN. We were... Not, not to say that, you know, it was minimal, but we, we yeah. did what we needed to do. And then I think what we've been discovering since then is that there's more that we, we can and should go do to build out the network in, in the right way. Mm -hmm. And that has been a, a lot of fun. It's been, you know, there are times where like, oh gosh, like we, you know, we don't even know what we don't know sometimes, but I think for the most part, it's been wonderful to kind of go through this and to be a startup again in many ways. And like, all right, this, you know, we got to have this and, and we're out there and, you know, learning so much as we talk to new retailers and as we talk to new brands at times. And yeah, it's just been, it's been fun to do that. It's incredible to see kind of the, you know, mid journey uh, awareness and, and move and re-strategize. I got to ask, this is one thing I've always found really interesting is the narrative of a startup, whether it be an internal startup that grows kind of additionally to the core business or, you know, a brand new startup, you always kind of externally get the Airbnb, right? Like story of they saw the future and it was up and to the right victory. <laughs> but there, everyone knows there's, you know, 
the line actually looks pretty chunky and, and up and down and, and wavy. What friction did you guys hit? Like, can you, I know it might be with the IPO recently, it might be a little bit tricky, but is there any stories you can tell us about kind of where you guys ran into a problem and had to figure out your way through it and maybe success did not look inevitable with this new kind of, with the new marketing performance marketing setup? I think we always had conviction that it was going to work out. I don't think we ever hit a, a moment in time where we felt uh, this was a bad idea. I think we were yeah. always like, this is going, this is going to work. We, f- we firmly believe in that. That said, I think, you know, in terms of the, the, the product we built, I think there were many times where we were like, oh, like maybe, maybe this was the wrong thing to build first and we need to revisit that. And so I think what we did well or what we kind of had to do, I think in many ways is just kind of be an incredibly adaptable organization mm-hmm. for, you know, I mean, even now, but I would say, especially for, for like the span of about a year, 18 months, I think where it was like, we don't know what we don't know. So th- there might be times where roadmaps get disrupted. And, you know, an emerging opportunity, some new feature or new API that needs to be built. Like we, we discover that in real time and it means that we're going to deprioritize a few things. And so I think just as a company, we rallied behind that and just got into that same mindset that like we, we need to be agile here. It's like that's why agility exists. It's why this, you know, this way of building mm-hmm. software exists is so that we can respond to change because change was kind of coming left and right at times. And so I, I think... Probably like the things we had to overcome were mostly just like not knowing the full landscape, you know, and and figuring it out as we were going. We we're kind of charting our course as we were like exploring this new terrain, which was a challenge, but again, also really fun. You just have to have the right mindset. I think people have to be on board for that kind of a journey because it's not for everybody, right? Like I think that's the other thing. Like you know, th- this this period of kind of zero to one product development does require a certain mindset a certain kind of mm-hmm. interest and skill set at times too and and it, it's not for everybody you know so but I, I think it's a lot of fun so yeah. you know yeah when you're looking at changing a roadmap you know what does it take i guess to, to interrupt that because a lot of work goes into planning and and say when you like you said you want to be agile but you also don't want to be just scattershot changing all the time sure. how do you how do how's the team over at abata kind of look at it and go, you know, here's our roadmap, but this is an opportunity, you know, we need to deviate for, or, you know, what, we're going to stay the course. We know it's important. This is going to go on the list and we'll get to it next quarter, maybe. Like what differentiates the two? How do you tell? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think in many ways it is the question and the job, right? Like, I think the only way to really, for me to answer this is to say that what we do is we just try and have good conversations about this as frequently as possible. Yeah. I think most people get upset about their roadmap being blown up when they don't have the context and they don't see it coming. Right. I mean, I think the connotation blow up is like, Oh, I didn't know if that was coming. So what we try and do is share as much information up and down the organization about what's coming and what may emerge. Mm -hmm. And I think in that way, people are kind of mentally prepared for it and, and they start to kind of come along the journey too. So we may say, Hey, we're really dis- we're really discovering in some conversations that this is an emerging need, and I want you and I say this to my team. I want you to be thinking about like how you might fit that into the roadmap. Like, what would the trade offs be? We have so many conversations where I'm like, just help me understand what the trade offs would be if we went this way versus that way. And I think that goes a really long way. And we have a monthly meeting that we have for all of our kind of key areas of uh, the product portfolio called a business impact report. And we all get together my leaders, uh, the tech leaders, and then some cross-functional leaders as well, cross-functional teams. And we just talk through like, here's what's going on. Here's how we're measuring against our, or here's how we're doing against our OKRs. Here are some emerging things. We also, at that time, will say, here's some emerging things that we're not doing. Like we, we've heard this, but we're not going to do this right now. And, and here's the rationale behind that decision. And so, you know, in a fast moving environment, I think it just comes down to making space and time for good conversations cross-functionally so everybody's on the same page. No, I love that you frame it too in what are the trade-offs because yeah. I've been at, and I think marketing is something especially prone to this I've seen where kind of shiny object syndrome can reign supreme if you're not careful and, and you start to have just work in progress pile up and pro- pile up and pile up and it's never too much because you start to be like, okay, well, you know, this can take a little longer, this cannot, but I do think often work in progress when it gets to a certain level is just the death of a lot of things. And that's the conversation we have a lot when we're looking to change is, okay, we can do that. 
here's what it costs and how we're going to change it. And we're not going to do this thing. That means, or that's, this will be off a month. So that's what we, we've really had to get crisp on that one internally and just say, in my all hands so with the, the whole product team, I will say here are the you know, top five, top 10 company priorities right now. We have a company priority list that as senior leaders we've agreed upon and and this is not like build a feature or whatever, but it's like, right. these are big problem areas, the strategic areas that we need to go attack. And just having that up there helps guide the team. Like, mm -hmm. okay, when I, I have a, a micro decision about this versus this, I can sort of map that to the team, the company's global priorities and say, okay, I see that this is actually a higher priority for the company. Therefore, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to work on this. And, and that helps to create sort of asynchronous alignment because it's, you know, it's hard to stay aligned as, a, as an organization, a, a growing organization. So we, we definitely work on that. But by certainly, you know, everybody in product, it, it's our job to say, I hear you stakeholder, I hear you CEO, whoever, what would you remove from these five things that that, that group is working on right now? And let's just have that conversation together so that you understand the trade-offs and, and so that we're sort of level setting on expectations that we're not going to deliver number five now because we've got a new number two, yeah. you know, or whatever it is. And how big, how big is the product org over there at Nevada? We are a little over 50 people right now. Yeah. So, I mean, you're hitting a level where you, you need to enable them to have that kind of self-actualized understanding of Absolutely. what the priorities are. Cause you know, at, I remember when we were, I joined log rocket really, really early. We were like 10 people. We were in a tiny little room in Cambridge mass Alignment there, I always tell people, is super easy, right? Because engineering was here, you know, our CEO and head of proc was here, <laughs> sales yeah, was here, yeah. and everyone knew what was going on everywhere. But as we grew, you know, how do you enable, you know, the leaders under you to make those smart decisions and, and understand, like you said, this is number two, this is number five, so we're going to do this one. So I, I love that you're kind of going through that with the team regularly and, and ensuring that there is that understanding. We, we we have this published, you know, for the company to see our, our we, we do a strategy board every year and then we sort of map that to a prioritized list for the things that really impact technology where we know we're going to have to build things, right? And I'll have that at that tab open all the time. I, I always have that tab open and I'll look in there and you'll just see, a variety of product folks and engineers and everything like popping in there, popping in and out. And you can tell that they're just coming in to kind of just sense check. I just yeah. need a sanity check. All right. Where is that on like the global priorities list for the company, which I think is really, really useful because, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. You get to a point where I mean, our technology organization is, you know, gosh, I think we're close to like four or 500 people now, just yeah. a technology organization. So my team is actually a very small part of the technology organization, but you get to that size and you've got to figure out ways for people to stay stay on the same page because it's yeah. just, it's hard. It's hard otherwise. No, it's great too, because also in product, I feel like we talk a lot about kind of what are your North Star metrics? What's the definition of success? And uh, it's always been hard for me to conceptualize. How do you define success for people being aligned or, or understanding that? I feel like kind of what you just said, maybe not the perfect North Star metric, but a good KPI is you have this prioritization doc. Are people referencing it regularly? Are they in there? Are they using it in a, in a ongoing process to run how they're thinking about prioritization. And if the answer is yes, you know, that's probably pretty good traction right there, right? If people are in there regularly, that's like that I would say that's a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. It's just, it's it's definitely a, a strong indicator, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I certainly keep an ear out too. Like, is this working? Is it helpful? Is it not helpful? So we're very open to feedback and just you know iteratively improving how we operate as a team too. So yeah. So to to stay on the team topic a bit, you've talked about kind of falling in love with the problem and not the solution. I think, you know, I, re I reread uh, Amp It Up by Frank Slootman over at Snowflake recently. And he talks a lot about, he thinks people kind of over, over, you know, focus on the solution and underthink about what is the thing they're trying to solve, right? What's the problem versus just solving it right away? What's the core thing you got? And I think that's kind of what you're saying there too, right? Yeah. Like fall in love with the problem, fall, fall in love with what you're solving understand it before. What does that look like in practice? So like, how do you kind of set up a team and build maybe a set of, you know, what were they called rituals in product sometimes? Or how do you set mm -hmm. up kind of a cadence where that's incentivized, where you want to really understand it before you go? Yeah. I think one of the things we've done is many of the groups within technology will look at kind of an idea backlog together. And in terms of just like ceremonies to, to help mm -hmm. foster this kind of culture, 
that's where the cross-functional leaders, engineering, design, product, you know, analytics, whomever, they all kind of get together and they're like, the product manager pulls together this list of ideas that are just sort of floating out there. I call this kind of always on product management. Like you're, you're just, Hey, I had a conversation with our CMO yesterday. And then I was looking at data this morning and then I, you know, was reading through customer feedback and like you start to have ideas coalesce Mm -hmm. and you go, all right, I think that there's this thing here. And so this group will get together and look at these just like rough ideas. And all of those are sort of must have like a problem statement with them. So we do, a product brief around these things when they start to get a little bit of traction. It's like, all right, what's the key problem that we're trying to solve here? How do we know that we will have successfully solved it? We, we talk a lot about UX outcomes too. So it's absolutely their business metrics and KPIs that we want to move, but there are also these UX metrics around how will we know that we've improved a user's life mm-hmm. if we do this the right way? So it sort of starts there at the very beginning where it's like, as this thing is starting to take shape, we really want to make sure that we have the problem statement really well defined. And then that way we can, if we move it to the next phase in the product life cycle, if you will, of, or we really need to do some discovery here. We've been kind of listening here, but now we've really got to learn. We're going to maybe put some UX research on it. We're going to really pull some you know, ad hoc data analysis to see if this is truly a problem worth solving. Maybe we put together a business case. Like when we go into that phase, I think we want to really make sure that we've dialed in on the problem and that we're not just like, hey, build this because, Mm -hmm. you know, build this, you can do it. And then you'll kind of anchor to this one way of doing it. And then suddenly that doesn't work. And you try, you know, bend over backwards trying to make it work. And it's like, no, 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 just go back to the problem you wanted to solve. Forget about what you built to solve the problem, but let's make sure we, we, we focus there first. So that's one way I think that we do it. And then I think it, it just comes from having a, a really empowered cross-functional team where we hold each other accountable, mm-hmm. right? I think I, I love when I hear our UX team push back on like, well, what problem does that solve? Like our engineers will push back. Well, is that really solving the right problem? You know, so I hear this in the conversations we have. And I think it just comes from everybody kind of embracing that culture where we, we work collaboratively on these things together and, and we, yeah, we, we make sure that we're doing it the right way. Yeah. And I think that that's a good, healthy culture is one where you can ask that question and people don't get defensive, but they back it up with data. They, they talk about the reasoning that got them there. And often, you know, here we say kind of done is not shipped the first time for, you know, if you're writing a plan doc or, or kind of business justification, but done is you've gotten feedback, you've incorporated it and, you know, it doesn't, make you weaker to take in outside influence or outside feedback. It actually makes you, you know, being humble enough to go seek that out makes you stronger and makes your idea stronger, makes the whole company stronger. So couldn't agree more. Now kind of to go on here, right? And I think part of this is you talk about also, you've talked about in the past, like the team that experiments the fastest and, and kind of has the quickest, fastest discovery is is probably going to win. I guess a, what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate a little bit? And B, mm-hmm. you know, how do you drive your team to have that velocity and, and ensure that you're driving that while still keeping with the solve the problem, understand the problem kind of philosophy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I mean by that is it's not about having one person or one group of people who have this, you know, flash of insight and, and suddenly know exactly what to go do. It's having the mechanism in place to figure out what it is that's going to work, that is more important than, you know, having the one idea or the one sort of, you know, the, the, the one person, the visionary, if you will, who, who has the idea and says, just go do this. It doesn't matter. I know that this is right. I think it's, you know, it's important to have a process to get to right, to figure out, okay, we think we're onto something. Now we have to quickly validate that and, and, and see if we're actually correct about that. So and I think maybe I, I, I arrived at that just because there aren't many visionaries out there, like true, true visionaries <laughs> who, who get it right. I maybe mean, I can count them on one hand, maybe. But like, so you know, the real kind of work of it is is the process to get us there, and to say we've got a kernel of an idea, we think this solves this kind of a problem. Now let's quickly come up with multiple solutions that we think would solve the problem, and which one does that best. So I think it's it's really about that. I mean. And yeah, in terms of how do you you foster that, I think part of it is, is having the right people who want to work really quickly. Bias to action is one of our product team operating principles. And I think we would much rather just start to work on something, define the problem, yes, spend a little bit of time doing that as a product manager, and then 
all right, let's just get started. Let's just like, I mean, I have this instinct a lot of times. I'll, I'll be thinking about something. I'll be in a conversation and I'm just like, I just want to draw this out. Can I just like start to draw how I think this might come to life? It's like, it, you know, it's like I almost have to exercise that or something. But, but yeah, I think it's, it's finding the right people who want to do that, who, who work well together and who aren't, you know, who aren't defensive about what they create. They have kind of an, an egolessness about them, which is really, really important, I think, in, in creativity and, and especially in product development. Yeah, I, I love the whiteboard for kind of what you just talked about. And it, it can be virtual or, or in, yeah. in person, but right, the, the idea, I feel like there's so many meetings we've been in, where we're trying to talk through how do we, you know, what's this problem and then how do we solve it and, and how do we look at it and frame the problem where finally someone just goes like, hold on, just give me the marker. I got to, let me just put this up there and you, a, a picture can conceptualize such a complex thing so easily if you, if you do it right. Totally. And we've had uh, to push on people to do that at times. Like yeah. I, I, sometimes I'll just say, just prototype it real quick. Like, let's just get a prototype put together really quickly and we'll poke holes in it. Like yeah. I'm not going to, you know, let's just poke holes in something. Like it just gets the, the conversation going. Right. It is, well, if you start moving so much of starting a business is just go start it, get the first customer, get going. Same with the idea, right? Once you get moving, it's a lot easier to keep it moving and optimize if you if you get going. So that's totally right. I, I kind of equate it sometimes to working out. It's like the minute I like get my gym clothes on, I'm like, all right, I'm committed. Like, yeah, I did this, and then you go and you, all right, I'm here now. <laughs> so right, I'm, I might as well keep going. And so it's like the minute you start to kind of work on something, you're like, well, we're already kind of doing it. Let's get, let's just keep going. So exactly, yeah. I'm I'm a five a.m. guy, five a.m. guy for the gym for that reason. Once I'm up at five, I'm like, well. All right, let's go. I'm up already. Might as well go. So Might now we're we're running short on time. I don't want to take too much of your day here, but I do want to hit on this. I feel like we're on the topic, so maybe we just fly through the thought here, right? Sure. You've talked about, you know, you kind of uh, probably have talked about Reed Hoffman has it right with the whole if you're not embarrassed by your first version of your product, you you've kind of waited too long. We've had some people on the show who have said maybe given the elevated expectation of digital experiences nowadays mm -hmm. minimal is not that minimal anymore and and now you know you talked about earlier too that you guys launched performance marketing with walmart who i know from experience are not you know minimal for them is not that minimal so how do you yeah. balance this idea of minimal product and good enough for expectations we've we've kind of called it for lack of a better word like minimal experience but the middle experience is still pretty high yeah I, I think it depends on, on what you're yeah. doing. I mean, context is so important here. I think, yeah, absolutely. Look, there there are times where um, we're not going to go to market, especially with a partner, with something that they're not comfortable with and we're not comfortable with. However, I would say, even in that situation, I think you, you may not put a product into production, but you could get a version out early in staging or even a prototype yeah. early to get the kind of feedback that I'm talking about, because what you don't want to do is go in a hole, come out, put something in prod, and then suddenly it's the wrong thing. And yeah. you could have gotten all of that great learning, you know, in that time that you spent in the hole thinking that you were going to figure it out. So it's really just about getting feedback as quickly as you possibly can. That's really all it is. And, you know, certain things, I think, you know, certain experiences, users may have a higher tolerance for knowing that it's a beta, which is fine. And so you can do it there. There are other cases where, if you set the context, I think that they can get behind it and go, oh, I, you know, I'm willing to kind of look beyond this because I know that this is a you know brand new feature and it's got the beta tag on it or whatever. But yeah, it's really just by getting quick feedback. Yeah, no, I love that ties right back, like you said, to like get it out there, start poking holes. Also, if it's a big, you know, like you said, a partner, maybe it's just you don't have every feature, but the experience of the core feature is great. So it's always yeah. min minimal is relative, right? Cool. Well, on that note, Charles, I could, I feel like I could talk to you all day, but you got a day to get back to, and I'm not going to keep you from it. Abada has a lot of performance marketing to do, and, and I'm sure you got a lot of a long roadmap to help drive there. So I want to get you back to it. I appreciate you taking the time, man. This was a great conversation. I had a blast. Where can people find you if they want to follow up and maybe ask you a question or, or anything like that? Where, you know, LinkedIn, anything like that where people can find you? Yeah, definitely hit me up on LinkedIn. Happy to connect with folks there. And yeah, you know, I love talking shop. So thank you for the invitation to, to speak with you today. And yeah, it's been fun. Sounds good, Charles. Appreciate you coming on, man. It was a blast. Talk yeah. to you soon.